I'm going to rant and rave a little bit this morning, uh, not at moms or not at you as mothers. Do you have my lapel mic on, please, or my headset? You okay there? You got it? All right. For those of you that are watching from home, the outline was sent out last night, and uh, you can connect to that as well. So let me um, just explain the topic. The devaluation of womanhood, femininity, and motherhood. That's what we're going to be talking about today. I can switch the other mic if y'all can't get it on. We're good? Okay, thank you. Switch mics. Got it. Okay, thank you. I don't know what the problem is. Anyway... So uh, the devaluation of motherhood, femininity, um, and womanhood. Now, the reason I'm discussing this is because of what's going on in our nation. What's going on in our culture. As you all know, women are no longer women, men are no longer men. Even though biologically they were created a certain way, and so the more I think about that and the more I study that and everybody goes, well, they have the right to be whatever they want to be. No, they don't. <laughs> Why do I say that? Because God made them a certain way, and that's a usurping of God's creation. And unless we get to the place in our society and culture that we understand that and we uphold that a man's a man, a woman's a woman, a mother's a mother, you see what I'm saying? Unless we get to the place where we uphold that, our country's done. Now, I don't really care about our country being done. That's up to God. However, what I do care about is the people that live in this nation that call themselves believers. Amen? And that's my concern as we begin today. Genesis 1, 27. If y'all get that working, let me know. Genesis 1, 27. Y'all know the verse. God created man... And the word man here means an individual human being in the Hebrew text, distinct from the name of the first male being Adam. Okay? Here's what he said. God created man, being individual human being, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them what? Read it with me. He created them what? Male and female. They're humans. And they, just like the animals... They have gender, male and female. A woman is a human, right? And because they have gender, he created them with being a male or female. And so we need to understand that. As believers, we don't really have an option. Do you understand what I'm saying? As believers, we don't have an option in this text, because this is what God has done. And then we go on to Genesis 2, 18, and here's what the Scripture says. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man. It, now, this is a description of his making of woman. It is not good for man, this individual human being, to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable. And that word suitable means someone that corresponds to him, just as males and females of animals correspond to one another. God had already created the animals, male and female, right? And so we knew that what was going on. And he says, look, there's not another person like the, the individual that I created who is a male, right? There's nobody uniquely matched for him is what this scripture says. So what did God do? We know what God did. He made a woman. Right? And so he made a male and a female who were compatible one to another. Okay, I'm changing mics. Um, you can punch down for me. This is kind of an interesting. Y'all know who Mary Shelley is? Okay, who's Mary Shelley? Anybody? Actually, I knew Lee would know this. <laughs> so, the modern Prometheus. Prometheus was a, meat, a, a Greek god, or semi-god, who uh, actually 
gave fire to humanity and gave engineering kind of to humanity. And uh, that was actually the, the subtitle of Frankenstein. Now, and y'all can check all this out. I've done all my research, okay? And I have a copy of the original Frankenstein in my office if you want to look at it. The monster, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, was told this by the monster. Frankenstein's a monster, right? You must create a female for me with whom I can live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. This you alone can do, and I demand it of you as a right which you must not refuse to concede. So Frankenstein, by the way, you know, understand this, Frankenstein was a being created out of existing matter, existing body parts, correct? And Dr. Frankenstein figured out how to give this monster life. And once this monster became alive, he interacted with humans and he became a very angry being killing people, if you remember that in the story. And as a result of that, he looks at families, he looks at people with children, and he realizes, I don't have that. And what he never had, there was something missing. Think about what was missing in his life. So we move from that, and I ask this question, what is making a human without a mother, without a woman? What is that? What is the making of a human, which in theory... Frankenstein was a human because it was all human parts. Everything that made up Frankenstein was a human part, right? And so I know it's fictional. I know it's probably the first sci-fi work. But maybe there's others. But, but I'm still using this example because you've got to get a hold of this. Is it usurping the very role, the God-ordained design of woman and motherhood? Is the creation, now listen to what I'm saying, is the creation of a being that is in theory a human being without it having a woman, without a mother, is that usurping the role of the God-ordained calling of mother, the God-ordained calling of a woman, and in fact the whole idea of God's creation? Is it usurping, yes or no? You can answer that question. It's on the outline. Now, I'm just going to take you through a little things because I believe that sci-fi speaks to what's going to happen in the future. Think about everything that you know about sci-fi. Now, some of you were raised but way before we were sending people into outer space, and what was sci-fi doing? Sending people into outer space, right? Some of you watched shows where people lived on the moon, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of things that have been revealed way before they actually occurred. Would you agree with me on that? Okay, with that thought in mind, I want you to think about The Brave New World. How many of y'all know the movie The Brave New World? Or the, or the, the book The Brave New World? Y'all know that, right? Yeah, written by a pagan, right? Brave New World. Well, in A Brave New World, how did babies come? Do you remember that? In A Brave New World, first thing you need to understand is the word male, female, mother, father, and family were words that were forbidden. And in fact, everybody was encouraged to sleep with whoever and not have a relationship with anybody on a permanent basis. Do you remember that as part of the movie? In addition to that, some of you don't remember it, maybe you're right or not, but, but these were obscene words, family, mother, wife. These were obscene words, and they weren't to be used. And in fact, all the children were basically genetically engineered and harvested, and each child was manipulated to be a part of the society and manipulated in such a way that they would fill a particular role in that society. Therefore, that society would always be in control, and you would be totally fulfilled in whatever that role was because guess what? You knew nothing else because you were genetically engineered to fulfill that role, and that supposedly would make you happy. Folks, are we close to this? Are we close to this? Think about it. What's going on? We have not, at this point, 
cloned a baby in a test tube and allowed it to be born outside of the womb. We're not there yet. Are we quickly heading that direction? And what's the purpose of that? They say, well, we'll eliminate all defects, but guess what can also happen? You can engineer whatever you want to happen. And what are you going to raise? You're going to have children without moms and dads. Now, they may be assigned to one, but I would propose to you the same thing is going to happen as what happened in Brave New World. When the child got old, they were sent off to the indoctrination camp, and in the indoctrination camp, they learned exactly what they were to be as adults. Well, let's go a little more up to date. Let's go to Matrix. Okay? Let's go to Matrix. Y'all know what Matrix is, hopefully. There's several of them now, right? Well, in the Matrix, hmm, punch down for me. Where are their babies in the Matrix? Yeah, in some room, Brenda says, yeah. Well, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. In the Matrix, where are the mothers? Are they visible in that movie? Mm. Where are the mothers? Well, I want you to consider the origins of the word matrix, number one. First of all, it's a Latin word. And it means, corruption mater or mater, it means mother. Well, the Latin developed, and guess what? As Latin developed, there became another meaning of the word, and actually the word matrix appeared in Latin, and it means a breeding female. And then in Old English, as the words developed, as the language developed, it means womb. So the matrix is what? The womb. And all the babies were birthed within that framework, conceived and birthed within that framework without a mother. In the matrix, fetus fills are fields upon fields of, uh, and, and this is interesting, synthetically grown human babies which are gathered and transferred by harvesting machines to the power plant as humans die off and are they deleted or or kicked out because they're ejected for some reason. So the process had nothing to do with mom and dad. The process had to do with what? Creating life different than what the Lord had told us to do. Everybody with me so far? Okay, I'm just hoping you're staying with me. I know I'm losing some of y'all are just going, yeah, this guy's crazy. And I am crazy. You already know that. So just, just you know, know, know what you're getting. Next, let's go to the next one. Oh, really? Most of y'all know this one for sure, right? Yeah, the Terminator. Well, I have a question for you. Who is the Terminator sent to terminate? Uh, really? Yeah, she sent to eliminate, he sent to eliminate the woman, Sarah Connor. Remember that? Okay, and Sarah Connor, y'all know this, was... You know, she was a, a timid, dazzle in distress at the beginning of the movie, right? She was a victim who became a hardened warrior and a mother who sacrificed everything for her son's life and his future role. Isn't that true? Because he was the key. So, now we know all the story of the Terminator and how things switched it around. But in the Terminator... I want you to understand this. Different from the other two sci-fi I spoke of, in the Terminator, the mom was what? Absolutely essential. Think about that. Now, I would propose to you that there are certain movie producers like Disney. Yes, I called their name. That if you watch many of their movies, look and see what happens to the woman or the mother. Think about that. Look what happens to the mother in many of these movies. And so I want you to realize that like with the Terminator and where we're moving in this, will we ever have machines like the Terminator? I don't know. But let me just tell you this. Punch down for me. Machines don't want or need a mother. But yet, in Frankenstein, he wanted a mate. Remember that? So 
I want you to think about this. Maybe you know who Andrew Claven is. He was born a Jew in New York. He became an atheist. Punch down for me. Y'all stay with me. He became an atheist, and then he converted to Christianity. All right? And he was a, he's an author now, screenwriter from Hollywood, no, got kicked out of Hollywood because of his Christian faith, media commentator. Here's what he said. Always and everywhere throughout history, women's scope of action has been restricted. But their role, their purpose, their value to society was crystal clear. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he's looking at, he's, he's alive now. He's looking at what's going on in our world today. And so what we have done to ladies, what we have done to women, and, and I am in no way saying that everybody has to be a stay-at-home mother. That's not what I'm saying here. Because the Bible doesn't support that, by the way. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But what I want you to understand is, is there is a distinct role that you as a mother, that you as a woman play in our society. And what our society has continued to do throughout history is try to discount that role and, and actually convince you that you're not really needed in that role of being a mom. And that's been going on for generation after generation. So now we go back to a quote by Mary Shelley that's in the book, Frankenstein. Listen to what she says. Now, she's a pagan, okay? And she wrote this book when she was 16 years old, and then it was re-released when she was 20-something. And she ran off with a guy that was married. But uh, I won't go into all that. Anyway, okay. So, but listen to what she says. Frightful must it be, for, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any, any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanisms of the creator of the world. And that's what she said about Frankenstein in the book. Dr. Frankenstein decided to build the Bride of Frankenstein in the book, if you know this. And what happened to the Bride of Frankenstein? He destroyed it because he was afraid of what would happen next. So anyway, just sharing some information with you guys, trying to hopefully wake you up. So I have a question. How long does it take for science fiction to become reality? How long does it take for science fiction to become reality? In sometimes a very short period of time. And what we need to recognize about science fiction become reality is maybe there's warning signs in science fiction that we need to wake up to. Because many times science fiction addresses issues socially, economically, biologically, many, many ways that maybe Christians need to start looking at and addressing. I'm not saying don't watch those movies. I'm saying have discernment when you go to watch them and figure out what the message is or what the issue is that may be being addressed. So here's the deal. God made woman biologically, physically, emotionally, and spiritually for motherhood. That was God's design. Somebody say amen to that. All right, I'm glad I got a couple of y'all to talk. And so we go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now the man had relations with his wife, Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. Now this is God's design. God could have made some more people, couldn't he? He could have populated the earth. No, he had a design. He had a way that he was going to do this. And it was through a man and a woman and conception, she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I've begotten a man-child. And in the Hebrew text, this is a male person. And then it says what? With the help of the Lord. Isn't that true? Every child that's born is born with the help of the Lord. Period. Stop right there. It's the work of Almighty God. And then we go on. And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. So we know that she conceived them. We know that she has other son, they have other sons and daughters. But I just want you to see this is the process that God designed. So in removing motherhood from society, is, is removing motherhood from society usurping the very role of moms and the very design of God? Answer that question. Going back to Andrew Claven. Listen. Through mother love, humans learn. 
Each of us begins to fashion a distinct and unique experience, a new creation made in collaboration with God out of our engagement with his creation. Folks, what do mothers do? They nurture the children. They hold them close to their heart, right? They teach them, they train them, they love them. Not saying that dads don't do that, but God created the mom specifically whenever the child is born to be that person that's going to engage and invest in that little life so they can grow up. Moms, thank you. Thank you. Because this is a significant role in our society. Now, I'm going to make all the moms really mad at me because I'm jumping over to Proverbs 31. Super mom, Proverbs 31. <laughs> and all the ladies roll their eyes back. I've heard this a hundred times, and I'm not one of them. Wait a minute, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. And the reason why, I'm going to tell you in just a minute. So I'm going to dispel some myths about Proverbs 31 before I teach Proverbs 31. First of all, the myths concerning Proverbs 31 woman. Even though she is the most popular woman in the Bible, she doesn't exist. Number one, she doesn't exist. Y'all understand that. This, this model is not out there. This is not a real person, rather an ideal example of an excellent, virtuous wife or woman or mom. And I believe that this was written to give King Solomon's sons an idea of what to look for. Now, I can't prove that. But I want you to think about the whole topic of Proverbs 31. So we go to Proverbs 31, verse 10 through 12. An excellent or virtuous wife or woman who can find. By the way, those are all proper interpretations of this verse. For her worth is far above jewels. Okay, guys, look at your woman right now, and I want you to say this. You're worth more than jewels. Okay, come on. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be chicken. Be a man. You're worth more than jewels. Okay. The heart of her husband trusts in her. I hope that's true. And he will have no lack of gain. Right? She does him good. I hope that's true. And not evil all the days of her life. Right? Now watch what's going to happen here. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She's happy about that. Notice the word delight. She's happy about what she's doing, right? She is like a merchant ship. And by the way, guys, don't call your wife a merchant ship. She will not enjoy that. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. Hmm. Notice that word maidens right there. Everybody see that word? Don't ignore that word. If you want to be a Proverbs 31, you may need some maidens. Oh, really? Well, I'm just telling you, the, the myth concerning Proverbs 31 is she's, she's a superwoman. Is that the myth? No, she is not a superwoman. In fact, guess what? She's not doing all this alone without help. What does she have? And she's already done enough stuff to need some maidens. You understand what I'm saying here? And, and so this is, this is a misnomer that we get our eyes on this and we go, well, I got to do all this stuff. Ladies, I'm trying to give you freedom today that you have in Christ Jesus. Amen. Next, we go to Proverbs 31, 16 through 18. She considers the field and buys it. Oh, she's an entrepreneur. And, and from her earnings, she plants a vineyard. By the way, we have an entrepreneur in the Bible named Lydia who's active in the church at Philippi, right? And guess what? There's no record of Lydia being married or having children. But she's what? A godly woman who contributes significantly to the work of that New Testament church. She might have been married. She may have been widowed. There's all kinds of ideas out there, but we don't know. And so if you're not married, I'm still talking to you. Okay? 
If you're not a mother, I'm still talking to you. This is all important. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. <laughs> she senses that her gain is good and her lamp does not go out at night. So now we go to the next myth. This woman has, has uh, you know, you don't have to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to be. That's not, see, I mean, and somebody reads this and says, well, the Proverbs 31 has kids and, and, and you know, takes care of the kids and, and does all this stuff. And, and then the Proverbs 31 is an entrepreneur and she manages her own business. And folks, let me tell you, that pressure is in our world today for every one of you ladies. You don't have to be that. You've got to be what God has asked you to be. Proverbs 31, 16 through 18. She considers the field and buys it, right? I mean, come on, people. Next myth. What did it say in that same verse? It says, her lamp does not go out at night. Next myth, she isn't sleepless. I mean, come on, people. God requires people to sleep. I don't sleep a lot, but God requires people to sleep. That's his design. Are y'all with me on this? Okay. Myth number five. Remember what all she was doing? You don't have to be a fashion designer and seamstress either. Now, there used to be a day in America even that the women made a lot of clothes. A lot of women made a lot of clothes. It wasn't the only thing that women did, but there was a time. But let me, let me ask you a question. Do you think that Deborah, who, by the way, we have no record of having children. She was married, but we have no record of Deborah having children. What was Deborah in the Old Testament? A judge. Do you think she's spending time at the spindle making clothes? She's a judge of the nation of Israel. Come on, people. You think she's busy? I think she was busy. And she did a great job, by the way, if you study that out. So we go now again to Proverbs 31, 19 through 21. She stretches out her hands to the staff being making garments, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. That's the very best you can have. Myth number six. The kids don't have to have all name brands only. Your kids don't have to have the best of everything. Somebody say amen. And in fact, if your children learn that younger, the better. If your parenting goal is to make sure your kids have it better than you did, what happens if you fail? I would not recommend that as a parenting goal. And you have no clue what the future holds in our economy in this America. I would not make that your goal. Can your kids have it better than you did maybe as a loving parent? Absolutely, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe you had great parents. Can your kids have it better than you had it in maturing in Christ? Maybe so. These should be the objectives, not to make sure they have 50 pairs of shoes and everyone's got a name brand tag on it. That's not the goal. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We've got to get over our materialism. Proverbs 31, 22, and 24. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is what? Fine linen and purple. And remember, Lydia was a seller of purple, which means it was one of the best things. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells... Oh, wait, but back to entrepreneurship. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belt to the tradesmen. Okay, ladies, are, are any of you all up for doing all this? I want to see a hand. Are any of you ready to launch this? Uh, well, okay. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles, I love this, at the future. She smiles at the future. She opens her mouth with, in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well in the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Myth number seven. Being smart is not the same as speaking wisdom and teaching kindness. I know a lot of ladies that try to get smart. 
That's not the key. Wisdom is the key. Her children rise up and call her blessed and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her. And ladies, I must speak for the men now. We're sorry. (laughs) Some of you guys should say amen. Thank you, brother. (laughs) Husbands rise up and call her blessed, saying, My many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Myth number eight. Very important. She's not organizing a bless me. I'm the best, perfect mom. It's all about me. Or I'm a victim, victim, so feel sorry for me campaign in her household. That's not what she's doing. And at that point, I would say, ladies, that's not your job. You're not to have a campaign for your victimhood. If you're a victim, leave. If you're a victim and you're being hurt, leave and, and do what the Lord says. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's ridiculous what's going on in our society. Brenda watches all these crime shows. These women inevitably get killed because they stay with the guy that was beating them. And maybe the church is at fault there because we're not protecting the women. Maybe we are. We need to change. We need to understand this. So, 31, 30, and 31. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is in vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. Amen. And I hope that is what you would take from this. And then it says, give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her. And what that means, praise her in the gates, it means just let that lady be the lady that she is, doing what God has asked her to do. And guess what? Her works will be noticed because she's walking in obedience to the Lord and doing what God has asked her to do. So let's talk about this for a minute. On your outline, there's a little blank. What are the many roles of a woman or wife or mother described in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31? So who's got some ideas? What, what do you see about this lady? What do you see? What were her roles? She's a business person, right? What else is she? She's a mother. What else is she? Yeah, she's a teacher. She's a servant. What else is she? Yeah, she's all kinds of things, isn't she? And I want you to think about that in the perspective of what do we have sitting in the room as mothers? What do we have sitting in the room as women? All the above. We have business women. We got people who are in the medical industry. We got people who are stay-at-home moms. We got people who are entrepreneurs with their own business. What do we have? And see, what I'm trying to get us to understand is, is is that you probably fit right in to one of these descriptions that's in Proverbs 31. But guess what? You're not going to fit all of them because it's not a true woman. It's a concept. It's an idea that was being laid out for, I believe, for the men to look for a virtuous woman that they can marry. And it's also a great example for us. So, woman, wife, mother, here's what she is. Woman, wife, mother, entrepreneur, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, these titles, these are all titles. They don't make up the sum value of who or what she is. Say that again, Alicia. (laughs) It doesn't make up the sum of what she is. And that's true for all of you as well in this room. All you ladies, all you moms, it doesn't make up the sum total of what you are. So what if you can check every box here? Let's say you just go down Proverbs 31. You go, yeah, I'm that. Yeah, I'm that. Yeah, I got that covered. You bet, man, I'm good at that. You know, there is no question. I've got all this. I'm it. I'm one of these. But yet, you're self-centered. You're mean. You're selfish, 
you're greedy, and you act like a word that I'm not going to say that, that rhymes with which. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, I mean, so you can check off all the boxes, but if you have these things going on, if you're mean, self-centered, selfish, greedy, or like a word I'm not going to say that rhymes with which, that I would say even though you check every box, there's still something wrong. What do you think? Amen? 1 Samuel 16, 7. Remember, we were looking for a king. The Lord said to Samuel, did not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. Remember that? Because I have rejected him, for God sees not as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Praise be to God. There's a 31 woman. There's a Proverbs 31 woman. The Lord looks at the heart. And the character is more important than the titles. The quality of the person is more important than all the titles. See, anyone can put on a Proverbs 31 mask. Anyone can put on a Proverbs 31 costume. Anyone can put on a Proverbs 31 cape and act like that from time to time. And yet you might be actually something different on the inside. Amen? So let's look at Proverbs 31 and apply it to our lives. First of all, who is the Proverbs 31 woman on the inside? And it's actually revealed here. But I think we get so focused on all the titles and all the activities and all the stuff that she's doing, I think we forget what the character and the quality and the very nature of this individual is. So first of all, she was excellent, is what New American Standard says, virtue or valiant in other translations, which means she was one of noble character. She had great character. In the Amplified Bible, it says this, a capable, intelligent, and virtuous woman who is he who can find her. That was asking a question. Y'all remember the very beginning of this chapter or, or this verse in 10? The question is, who can find somebody like this? The answer was, there's nobody out there like that. But you can find some of these characteristics. But the key is, is what's on the inside, not the title of what they're accomplishing. Amen? So, for her worth, she is what? Far above jewels, right? Pearls and rubies. Her worth, this woman that's got noble character, is worth far more. Now, ladies, listen. This is probably the harshest thing I'll say today to the ladies. All women either add to or remove value in their home, in their business, in their relationships, and in their church. You either add to or you take away. Every lady in this room, that's true for. You either add to the value or you take away from the value. Think about that. It's not all about you. And men, it's not all about you either. And it's not all about the kids either. Or the dog. I mean, or the cat, or whatever. Right? Are, are, y'all understand what I'm saying? Very important. Moving on. Next thing I want you to understand, the Proverbs 31 woman, she was diligent. This is not busyness. Or we made up a word here. I couldn't get it to, I couldn't get it to work on the internet. So, busybodiness. That's my word, okay? Busybodiness. So, this is not busyness. Being diligent is he, isn't busyness. There's a lot of people who are engaged in busybodiness. They can't sit still. They've all guys got to be doing something. But she's taking care of the essentials. You understand what I'm saying here? She's taking care of her children. She's taking care of her husband. She's doing what's needed in her business. But she isn't just having to be a little, a little bee running around, always buzzing, trying to make things happen. That's not what this woman is, even though she is diligent. What does the Bible say in Proverbs 21, verse 5? The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage. Remove that. 
Next, ladies. She's productive. She's fruitful. In Ezekiel chapter 19, verse 10, the nation of Israel is being spoken of here. And look what in, in the prophet Ezekiel speaking to the people of the land. He says, your mother was like a vine in your vineyard, planted by the waters. It was fruitful and full of branches. Now, the prophet is speaking to the nation of Israel about their condition when they came into the promised land. He says, look, this is what you had. You, were, you had this vineyard, and, and it was prosperous. It was fruitful. It was full of branches. And that, the illustration here is the mother was the beginning of the nation of Israel. But also, ladies, let's look at this as a call to a mother. A mother can be like a vineyard planted by the water, which prospers which grows, which is fruitful. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 through 18, remember what Jesus said? So every good tree bears what? But the bad tree bears what? Ladies, remember that. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree what? Produce good fruit. So what do you want to be, ladies? You want to be a good tree that produces good fruit. You want to have those good vines. You want to have those good branches. Because what's going to come out of you? That which is good. Amen? Next, Proverbs 30, woman on the inside, she was generous. She's a blessing to others, and she intentionally provided needed resources. Proverbs 31, 20 said what? She extended her hand to the poor, and she stretched out what? out her hands to the needy. So she was a generous person, not a greedy person, where she demanded everything be focused towards her. She was a generous person. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, you know the verse, give and it will be given to you, right? Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by the standard of the measure, it will be measured to you in return. The way you give, it will be returned to you. That's true of your finances, but that's true of many, many areas of your life as well. Next, number five, courageous. She was confident as she allowed the Lord to order her steps. She was confident. Remember, she was going to smile at the future. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Proverbs 31, 25 says, Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she what? smiles at the future. Ladies, are we smiling at the future? Are we smiling at the future? Romans 13, 14 says this. Put on. Right? You don't know the verse. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust or its strong desires or its passions. You know what keeps us from smiling at the future? Our flesh. Pretty simple. Six, she was wise. She can speak with wisdom because she has become wise. You don't become wise overnight. She speaks with wisdom because she has become wise, not neglecting. Now listen to what I'm saying here, ladies. She doesn't neglect the cultivating of her mind and her heart, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. She's not neglecting. Hear what I'm saying, ladies, because I know you're going to get so busy because you're going to be busybody, and you think you got to do all this stuff so you'll be the Proverbs 31, and you're capable of fly. But wait a minute. Nurture your soul. People, people say, well, take time for yourself. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying nurture your soul. Nurture your heart in the things of God, and you'll be a better mom, and you'll be a better wife. And you know what? And the supper may be late. The dishes may not get done. The laundry might have to wait a day. Because the nurturing of your soul and your heart, see, the, the strengthening of you as a woman in the Lord is the greatest and most powerful thing you can do. And that's for your husband, for your children, 
for your society, for your church, for your family, for everybody around you. That's the greatest thing you'll do. Romans 16, 19, you know the verse. We sing the song, right? But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent of what? And the God of peace will what? The rest of the verse. And the God of peace will what? Soon what? Crush Satan underneath his feet. And that's true for us as well. Amen? And number seven, last one, she's devoted. She's committed to the Lord. She's accepting her calling. Her calling as a woman. She's accepting her callings. Their calling as a wife. She's accepting her calling as a mother. And even her proper place in society and in the community. Not what the world tells you to be. Do not be what the world tells you to be. Be what God has asked you to be. Be what God has called you to be. Matthew 6, 24, you know the verse. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You got one master. His name is Jesus Christ. Serve him. Follow him. Nurture your heart with him. So I believe today it's these characteristics, these inner qualities that make the Proverbs 31 woman worth far more than jewels, worth far above jewels. What do you think? See, I think we are so busy looking at all the activities, looking at all the stuff that she accomplished, and we forget what's on the inside. It's the woman that fears the Lord that is certainly worthy to be praised. That's what the proverb said, right? So with that in mind, let me just encourage you with this. Today and always, may we never devalue women. I'd like for you to make a commitment today as a woman and all the men in the room that you will hold women in the high esteem that they deserve as God's creation given a specific purpose in this world. And we are not to deny that purpose. We're not to short-circuit that purpose. Every child that comes in this world needs a mother. Or they'll end up being like Frankenstein. Serious. Every child that comes in this world needs a mother, a loving mother who will nurture them in the ways of the Lord. Let's say you're already past that. Let's say you're older than that. Well, what does the Bible say? It says the older women are to teach the younger women how to what? Love their babies? No. It's not what it says. The older women are to teach the young women how to love their husband. What a verse. Want to have a strong family? Hmm. Talk to some older women who have been down the road. Talk to some committed, faithful older women that have served the Lord all their lives. You'll learn. You'll learn. So I want us to hold women in high esteem. I want us to hold moms in high esteem. I want us to never devalue the role of being a mother because we know that Christ is our Savior but if you want to save society, mothers have to be mothers. Mothers have to be mothers. So a truly appreciating a lady's femininity, folks, they're not the same. Men and women aren't the same. God didn't create them to be the same. That doesn't mean a girl can't play softball or, or whatever she wants to do. That doesn't have anything to do with it. That doesn't mean a woman can't be exalted to the highest CEO position in the world. It has nothing to do with it. But women are feminine. God created them that way. Let's honor that instead of degrading that. And that's a message to both men and women. And let's recognize God's design. The Bible says that, that men are to understand this part of that. Now, Every woman in this room, every mother in this room has a precious place that our Lord has entrusted to you. 
Whatever that is, whatever that role is, he's entrusted that you. Don't go over here to the Proverbs 31 woman and say, I got to be one of these. I got to be one of these. I got to be. Don't listen to the pressure role. You got to do this if you want to be a fulfilled woman. You got to do this if you want to be a happy woman. You got to do this if you want to be a wealthy woman. Give all that up and follow what the Lord has to say about your life. And so the Lord has entrusted to every lady here, to every wife here, to every mother here, a calling. And will you surrender, ladies, the calling that the world is trying to impose upon you? Look, we don't have to love those that are changing their gender. We don't have to love them. And why, why am I saying that? Well, here's the deal. We say, well, we're supposed to love all, all humanity. I don't disagree with you on that. But what the idea of the love of the body of Christ is, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And they cannot be a brother or sister in the Lord because they denied the very creation of God. Now, can they come to Christ? Yes. And then we can love them as a brother or sister in the Lord? Yes. But when they come to Christ, it calls repentance. And they walk out of the lifestyle, whether they're gay or lesbian or whatever it may be. Oh, you're preaching against the gays? Yes, I am. Because it's a denial of what creation is. It's a denial and a usurping of what God designed for our society and our culture, as well as every society and every culture in the whole world. And if the church is going to be silent on that, now what happens? The gay person walks in the door. Do we kick them out because they're gay? No. We encourage them. We love them. We teach them. And what I mean by loving them is we're not throwing them out. But, folks, we cannot be in relationships with them because they're denying the things of God. You say, that's a really hard message. I understand that. But, folks, if the church is not going to stand up for society, our society's done. We're the only people that uphold the standard of marriage. We're the only people that uphold the standard that a man is a male, you know, and he's got certain biological parts. And a woman is a female, and she's got certain biological parts, and those are designed to come together in the context of marriage, and that settles it. And the church must stand right there. You say, that's really mean, and it's really not tolerant. Folks, we are the most tolerant people in the whole world. It's the gays and the lesbians and the transgender people that aren't tolerant because they're not tolerant of what we believe. And it's about time we understand that. We are tolerant. We're not killing gay people. The Nazis did. The Russians do. We're not killing lesbians, are we? No, and we're not declaring that, are we? No. We're the most tolerant group in the whole world because we've experienced the grace of Almighty God. Because we've experienced the mercy of Almighty God. And we can extend that to others. But we can't be in these tight relationships with the world. Isn't that true? We're not of the world. And we can't fellowship with darkness. Amen? But we can certainly help darkness come to light. And that's our call. So thank you for listening. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today and for us to honor our mothers. So uh, Brother Pastor Jacob's coming. He's going to lead us in a song, and we're dismissed. I don't know where he is, actually. Oh, he's over here. There he is. Okay. Thanks. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>